As COVID-19 cases spike in some countries, it's clear that the pandemic isn't slowing down. That's why many are pinning their hopes on a vaccine. We're pretty cautiously optimistic that at the end of the year, beginning of this coming 2021, we will have one and maybe more, I hope more than one vaccine that would be available. Thousands of scientists are now working on more than 150 vaccines, but none is approved for use. So just how close are we to getting an effective coronavirus vaccine? That's the big question. Welcome to your COVID-19 special on DW News. I'm Monica Jones in Berlin. Good to have you with us. The fight against the pandemic is gaining momentum. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration has granted fast-track designation to COVID-19 vaccine candidates under development by Pfizer and its German partner, BioNTech. Now, this is an important step towards getting approval for a vaccine the world is desperately waiting for. Things are moving quickly at BioNTech. The company's search for a vaccine began in January. By April, it had already begun clinical trials, research at record speed. Production has also been racing ahead. The European Investment Bank has pledged a 100 million euro loan if the human trials are successful. BioNTech and pharma companies all over Europe are gearing up for mass production of a potential vaccine, even if success remains uncertain. We're already equipping our facilities and finding production partners all over the world to help us produce large quantities. As soon as our production process is up and running, we'll also start producing and stocking it, despite the economic risk of having to throw away all this vaccine if it doesn't succeed in trials. An impressive number of projects, including SARS-CoV-2 vaccine trials, are underway at universities and companies in Germany, Switzerland and Austria. But research is advancing all over the world. 23 substances are already being tested on humans in projects mainly centered in Europe, the US and China. All told, scientists are now investigating more than 150 different vaccine candidates. This is necessary because it's quite clear that no single manufacturer could really meet the world's vaccine needs. Global demand can only be met if several companies are producing in parallel, each with their own facilities and with their partners. BioNTech says it could have a vaccine as early as December. And for more, I'm joined by Professor Klaus Zichotek, president of the Paul Ehrlich Institute. That's the German Federal Institute for Vaccines and Biomedicines. Good to have you with us. So we just heard here at the end of the report, a vaccine by December this year. How optimistic are you that this will work out? I think generally I'm very optimistic that we will have vaccine products that will uh, be filed for marketing authorization in the US and Europe. In general, uh, for example, the company BioNTech has provided us with encouraging immunogenicity data on a couple of dosages they used from a phase one, two trial, and also on the tolerability of these dosages, which is very important. They have also found out that uh, one of the large doses is not so well tolerated. And I think the next step will be to start now phase three efficacy trials and also getting some more information on the vaccine safety in Brazil, US and Germany. And then there is a very good possibility if these data come out positive, that filing at least for marketing authorization could occur. And we, uh, as uh, the European Medicines Agency have already indicated that a rolling review would be possible, which means that once the data come in, they can be submitted for review by the regulators one mm -hmm. after the other. All right. Of course, when we talk about uh, thousands of scientists currently working on developing a vaccine against SARS-CoV-2, we also talk about a huge variety of approaches. BioNTech is working on a so-called nucleic acid vaccine that's based on genetic instructions. Let's just take a quick look at how this works. 
To develop an mRNA vaccine, scientists have to access SARS-CoV-2's genetic code. They can then synthesize messenger RNA, molecules that carry information from the virus, like how to build specific proteins. The synthetic mRNA is enclosed in a lipid nanoparticle, which delivers the vaccine to our cells. Once inside, cellular machinery follows the mRNA instructions and begins producing the viral protein, which is then displayed on the surface of the cell. That stimulates a protective response from the immune system. Now, Professor Klaus Tichutek uh, from the Paul Ehrlich Institute, please tell me what makes an mRNA vaccine a good candidate in the fight against SARS-CoV-2? Well, first of all, we have to say that uh, we regulators are open to any kind of vaccine platforms that are currently developed as candidate vaccines against COVID-19. What makes RNA vaccines attractive is the technological progress that has been made during the last years. And although we don't have a licensed human preventive vaccine yet, we know from studies, uh, at least in the preclinical or in a clinical trial phase, also on tumor vaccines, that they are generally immunogenetic. Uh, genic. Uh, the next point, of course, is uh, that they use genetic information. And so the steps that are usually used for vaccine development, which are isolating the virus, getting the genetic information, adapting the virus to cell culture mm. and bringing it up uh, in high amounts in cell culture can be omitted with an RNA vaccine. So we are left with a lower biosafety limit. And the other plus is, of course, that companies have announced that they can produce millions and millions of vaccine doses up to the formulation within and six weeks or so. That's what which we would need, really of be course. A plus. That's what we need, of course. But people also have to be willing to be vaccinated. And as you know, uh, there is a lot of resistance uh, to anything that's genetically modified from crops to drugs. How justified are these concerns, especially when it comes to mRNA vaccines? Well, first of all, I don't think these prejudices still exist when it comes to the application of genetic information and gene technology uh, in humans and in medicine, because it has been shown that this is a very effective and very safe technology. Number two, uh, with RNA vaccines, we don't have the issue of any incorporation of sequences into the genome of cells or be it the germline. Nothing like that can happen because RNA is a rather fragile molecule. And uh, third of all, with all the different vaccines, no matter whether we know the platforms already in detail or not, they are always treated as one unique new thing that we need all the data about to really understand their safety and uh, efficacy. So the end is that the regulators have to come on the basis of data to a benefit-risk evaluation, and that has to be right. And with okay. preventive vaccines, we really need a large plus to the benefits compared to any risks that we may take into right. account. So it's safety first. That's good to know. Professor Tsichutek from Germany's Federal Institute for Vaccines and Biomedicines, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Well, next up is uh, Derek Williams. He, of course, is our science correspondent and he's been hard at work answering your questions about COVID-19. Here's our latest installment. Does remdesivir work against COVID-19 and how? Remdesivir is an antiviral medication that was originally developed to fight Ebola um, that has been repurposed in the fight against COVID-19, which is, is why it's come so far, so fast in, in, in trials. Um, usually that whole process takes much, much longer. Um, in the meantime, because it proved safe during testing in the last Ebola epidemic, it's been approved for emergency use in many countries uh, for COVID-19. As the pandemic continues to, to, to rage, supplies of, of remdesivir worldwide are running short, even though a final regulatory approval in most countries hasn't come yet. Um, the drug works by interfering with viral replication inside the cell. It, it kind of throws this, this monkey wrench into the, into the viral reproduction process. Um, studies have shown that it can shorten hospital stays for severely ill COVID-19 patients. Um, the company that produces the drug now says that its observational data 
shows that remdesivir also reduces mortality, but, but that still hasn't been confirmed by, by clinical trials. Is COVID-19 latent like herpes? A number of viruses, not, not just the ones that cause herpes, uh, can go dormant in the body and then, then reactivate at a later point in, in life. Um, Chickenpox, for example, uh, does it too. Even if you had chickenpox as a child, uh, the virus that causes it can remain dormant in your nerve cells and, and, and manifest even decades later as a, as a skin condition called, called shingles. So, so after an initial infection, could SARS-CoV-2 also go into hiding in your body? Um, although it's true that, that many patients struggle for months with symptoms of a COVID-19 infection, uh, that isn't real dormancy in the way we usually mean it. Uh, generally, the viruses that are able to lay low in the body for, for decades are, are DNA viruses, like those that cause chickenpox or, or herpes, or, or their RNA retroviruses, uh, like the one that causes HIV. And, and, and coronaviruses don't fall into either one of those categories. So although nothing has been ruled out completely, um, we've never observed latency in coronaviruses, and, and we don't expect it uh, from SARS-CoV-2.